Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston from Our Blooming Catholic Life. And when you're watching this, it should be the fourth Sunday of Advent. I'm very excited to bring this to you. Um, when we were looking at the Catechism of the Council of Trent recently, um, we noticed again the sermon program in it, which I've seen the sermon program again, but I'm not a priest. I'm not preparing a homily. And so I have ignored that section up until now. But this giant footnote jumped at me when we were looking at it the other day, and I'm very excited to read it to you. It says, this program embraces a complete course on Christian doctrine. The subjects are drawn from the Gospels and Epistles of the Sundays and Feasts and are treated in the pages of this catechism as referred to. So each day, whether it's a Sunday or some sort of a feast, has two things, a <laughs> a dogmatic subject and a moral subject and it gives us the reading and it normally only gives us one verse but since we're not doing the whole reading here together I'm going to go ahead and read like the whole chapter that that comes from I really want us to have some context and then it refers to various pages in this catechism now the notes going to go on <clears throat> It says that there are two other books, a sermon outline and further development of each of the subjects. And I believe that these are two separate books, the Gospels and Epistles of the Sundays and Feasts with Outlines for Sermons, which is probably a great resource for priests. I'm really interested in a parochial course of doctrinal instructions for all Sundays and holy days of the year. And I'm going to have to look that up and see if that book still exists. Can we get it anywhere? Uh, can I convince Tan Books or somebody to send that to me? I don't know. And it, just a slight disclaimer here. If you've seen the little thing at the top saying it's sponsored by sponsored, I mean, my husband bought me this book one time when we were on vacation but we paid full price for it, which you can see. However, I am an affiliate of TN Books, which means if you click in the link in the description below um, and go to that link and you purchase this book yourself, I'll get a small proceed from that. Is that why I'm telling you about this? No, but if you do that, it would really help my family and we would greatly appreciate that. So I feel the need to mention that. Let's jump in here. What is the dogmatic subject and the moral subject for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Dogmatic subject is that Christ is our Lord and our moral subject is conscience. So for Christ our Lord, it says, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his path. And then it says to read chap Luke chapter three, verse four. So we're going to go ahead and read all of chapter three. And I'm doing this from my Dewey Rames Bible, which again is from Tan Books. And again, because I wanted it not because they bought it for me. And again, if you buy it from the link, blah, 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 I'll get some portion of the money. Thanks for helping out my family. Chapter three. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate became gov being governor of Judea and Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee and Philip, his brother, Tetrarch of Itera in the country of Traconis and Lysantius, Tetrarch of Abilinia. Under the high priest Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. Interesting that that's letting us know who the high priests are. But the word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways plain and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the multitudes that went forth to be baptized by him, ye offspring of vipers, who hath showed you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of penance. And do not begin to say, We have Abraham for our father. For I say unto you that God is able to, of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. For now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be cut down and cast into a fire. And the people asked him, saying, What then shall we do? And he answering said to them, He that hath two coats, let him give to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do in like manner. And the publicans also came to be baptized and said to him, Master, what shall we do? But he said to them, Do nothing more than that which is appointed to you. And the soldiers also asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, 
do violence to no man, neither calumniate any man, and be content with your pay. And as the people were of opinion in all thinking in their hearts of John, that perhaps he might be the Christ. John answered, saying unto all, I indeed baptized you with water, but there shall come one mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his barn, but the chief he will burn with an unquenchable fire. And many other things exhorting did he preach to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, when he was reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, he added this also above all, and shut up John in prison. Now it came to pass, when all the people were baptized, that Jesus also being baptized and praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape as a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself beginning at the age of thirty years, being, as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, who was of Heli, who was of Mathet, who was of Levi, who was of Melchi, who was of Jan, who was of Joseph, who was of Matthias, Matthias, who was of Amos, who was of Nahum, who was of Helsai, who was of Nagai, who was of Manath, Matt, sorry, Matheth, who was of Matthias, who was of Semai, who was of Joseph, who was of Judah, who was of Jonah, who was of Reza, who of Zorobabel, who of Salathiel, who was of Neri, who was of Melchi, who was of Adai, who of Consan, who of Zahelmadan, who was of Hare, who was of, ah, tricked me there, who was of Jesus, who was of Elzir, who was of Joram, who was of Mathat, who was of Levi, who was of Simeon, who was of Judas, who was of Joseph, who was of Jonah, who was of Elikim, who was of Melia, who was of Mena, who was of Matthea, who was of Nathan, who was of David, who was of Jesse, who was of Obed, who was of Boaz, who was of Salmon, who was of Nesson, who was of Minadab, who was of Aram, who was of Esron, who was of Phares, who was of Judas, who was of Jacob, who was of Isaac, who was of Abraham, who was of Ther, who was of Nekor, who was of Sarug, who was of Ragol, who was of Phalag, who was of Heber, who was of Saleh, who was of Canaan, who was of Aphraxid, who was of Sem, who was of Noah, who was of Lamech, who was of Methula, Methula Salah, who was of Henoch, who was of Jared, who was of Mal- Malaleel, who was of Canaan, who was of Hinas, who was of Seth, who was of Adam, who was of God. Mm. We don't normally read that far, do we, that we end up with the and who was of God. The line there, again, was chapter 3, verse 4. That was, as it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. And have we done that as we have prepared for this holiday season? Um, This is a unique fourth Sunday of Advent, if you're watching when this airs first, um, because Christmas is real close. So if you have not made straight the way of the Lord, um, you're a little out of time. Call the priest now for some confession and get in there as quickly as you can and make note of the works of charity that we are called to do, especially in this season. Now let's go ahead and look at some of the other pages here, 40 to 41. And back in our Catechism of the Council of Trent, it's saying pages 40 to 41. It's interesting how it doesn't give us the topic other than Christ is Lord. So let's come in here. 40 to 41. Our Lord, it's in quotes, our Lord. Of our Savior, many things are recorded in sacred scripture. Some of these, it is evident, apply to him as God and some as as man, because from his two natures he received the different properties which belong to both. Hence we say with truth that Christ is almighty, eternal, infinite, and these attributes he has from his divine nature. Again, we say of him that he suffered, died, and rose again, which are properties manifestly that belong to his human nature. Besides these terms, there are others common to both natures, as when in this article of the creed we say, Our Lord. If then this name applies to both natures, rightly is he to be called our Lord. For as he, as well as the Father, is the eternal God, so he is the Lord of all things equally with the Father. And as he and the Father are not the one one God and the other another God, but one and the same God. So likewise, he and the Father are not the one, one Lord, and the other another Lord. Um, As man, 
For it is also many reasons appropriately called our Lord. First, because he is our Redeemer who delivered us from sin. He deservedly acquired the power by which he is truly is and is called our Lord. This is the doctrine of the Apostle. He humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. For which cause God also hath exalted him, and hath given him a name which is above every other name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bend, and those that are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. And of himself he said, after his resurrection, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. He is also called Lord, because in one person both natures, the human and the divine, are united. And even though he had not died for us, he would have yet deserved by this admirable union to be constituted common Lord of all created things, particularly the faithful who obey and serve him with the fervor of their souls. What then are the duties that are owed to Christ our Lord? It remains, therefore, that the pastor remind the faithful that are from Christ. We take our name and are called Christians, that we cannot be ignorant of the extent of his favors, particularly since by his gift of faith we are enabled to understand all these things. We, above all others, are under obligation of devoting and consecrating ourselves forever, like faithful servants, to our Redeemer and our Lord. This indeed we promised at the doors of the church when we were about to be baptized. For we then declared that we renounced the devil and the world, and we gave ourselves unreservedly to Jesus Christ. But if we be enrolled as soldiers of Christ, we consecrate ourselves by so holy and solemn a profession to our Lord. What punishments should we not deserve if after our entrance into the church and after having known the will and laws of God and received the grace of the sacraments, we were to form our lives upon the precepts and maxims of the world and the devil, just as though when cleansed in the waters of baptism, we had pledged our fidelity to the world and to the devil and not to Christ, the Lord and Savior. What heart so cold as to not be inflamed with love by the kindness and goodwill exercised towards us by so great a Lord who, though holding us in his power and dominion as slaves ransomed by his blood, yet embraces us with such ardent love as to call us not servants, but friends and brethren. This assuredly supplies the most just and perhaps the strongest claim to induce us always to acknowledge, venerate, and adore him as our Lord, because he paid literally the price for our lives. It's like saying he owns us, and yet instead of treating us as slaves, he treats us as brothers and sisters and friends. And as we have accepted that with our baptism, with our confirmation, we get go every Sunday to worship him. We're assenting to this. Every Easter, we renew our baptismal vows. In fact, every time we enter a church, when you dip your hand in the water and make the sign of the cross, you are affirming your baptismal vows. And are you then living that way in your life? That's what it's calling you to reflect on here. And this could be an occasion Um, We just had the Catholic New Year. We're coming up on the secular New Year. Um, I'm hoping that you have grabbed yourself a, a journal of some sort. Everybody likes to grab a journal during this time. And perhaps include the practice of the daily exam and look for things to be grateful for and jot them down in your book so that when you are in times of desolation and darkness, you can go back and remember the mighty things the Lord has done for you and reflect on whether you have in fact, also shared those gifts with others. Let's look at the next one here. Page 537. Ooh, pretty far back here. 537. I'm wondering if this wouldn't be in the section on the Our Father. No, this is in prayer in general. Ah, I'm guessing it's here Um, The section probably, we must pray in the name of Jesus Christ. The Son of God would also have us present our prayers to the Father in his name. For by his merits and the influence of his mediation, our prayers acquire such weight as they are heard by our Heavenly Father. For he himself says in St. John, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, that if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. And again, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that I will do. And please note that whenever they quote scripture in the Catechism of the Council Trent, it's in italics and the citation is given. So you can then go off on a study. Um, That was John 16, 
and John 14 that were both included in that one. And so reminding us, so whereas the first one spoke to me, talking about gratitude and actions we might take, this is telling us when we have our prayers of supplication, um, to remember to ask them in the name of Jesus Christ. So it's, again, really reflecting our prayer and our life as Christians. Let's look page 557 to 558, just a little bit further in here. What is this? This is in the section on the Lord's Prayer. This is, um, I'm going to guess, <laughs> is the section on what sanctification of God's name we should practice. Aha! So what does it mean to sanctify God's name? It says here, the pastor should be careful to insist particularly on the fact that it is the duty of a good son not only to pray to God his Father in words, but also to endeavor by his conduct and actions to promote the sanctification of the divine name. Um, there's the... You know, we've been talking about the Holy Face devotion, which does include a good bit of the devotion to the holy name of Jesus as well. And would to God that there were none who, though continually praying for the sanctification of God's name, yet as far as in them lies, violate and profane it by their deeds, by whose fault God himself is sometimes blasphemed. Oh, no. Is it my fault that God has been blasphemed by anyone? Well, am I a good Christian and am I holding up an example to others? Or am I given, giving Christ literally a bad name? Ooh, that one hurts, doesn't it? It was of such of these that the apostle said, the name of God through you is blasphemed among the Gentiles, Romans 2.24. And in Ezekiel we read, they entered among the nations whither they went and profaned my holy name when it was said of them, this is the people of the Lord and they are come forth out of his land. And that is in Ezekiel 36.20. For according to the sort of life and conduct led by those professing a particular religion, so precisely in the eyes of the unlettered multitude will be the opinion held of that religion in its author. And by unlettered here, I am saying those who don't understand Catholicism or Christianity, because there are many such people out there who do not understand it. And so those who do not know, if I'm not living the life, I'm not exactly being a good example and inspiring them. And so I am causing them to blaspheme. I'm causing others who aren't even Christians yet to sin against our God. That's awful. It's awful. Again, another great reason to go to First Saturday Devotion and make reparations. Those uh, first Saturday and first Friday. I'm going to include both those. Those, therefore, who live according to the dictates of the Christian religion, which they have embraced, and who regulate their prayers and actions by its precepts, furnish others with a powerful motive for greatly praising, honoring, and glorifying the name of our Heavenly Father. Aha! So the converse is true. If we truly lead a Christian life, we're going to be encouraging others, even those who don't believe, to give glory and honor to God's name. As for us, it is a duty which the Lord has imposed on us to lead others by shining deeds of virtue to praise and glorify the name of God. This is how he addresses us in the gospel. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. And the prince of the apostles saying, having your con conversation good among the Gentiles, that they may, by the good works which they shall behold in you, glorify God. 1 Peter 2.12 um, it does also refer us to the Summa Theologica 2A, 2AE, XXXI, uh, XLIII. And I'm doing that because I'm not 100% this moment what the L is, if that's 50 or not. Sorry. Oh, we also have page 619, and we're still on the doctrinal bit. 619. So many things to think about this Christmas. Um, this must be the remembrance of the victory of Christ and his saints. The faithful should also reflect who is their leader against the temptations of the enemy, namely Christ the Lord, who was victorious in the same combat. He overcame the devil. He that is stronger man. He is that stronger man who, coming upon the strong-armed man, overcame him, deprived him of his arms, and stripped him of his spoils. 
Luke 11, 22. Of Christ's victory over the world, we read in St. John, have confidence, I have overcome the world, John 16, 33. And in the apocalypse, he is called the conquering lion, Apocalypse 5, 5. And it is said of him that he went forth conquering that he might conquer, because by his victory, he has given power to others to conquer. And here it's telling us to refer to the Summa Theologica 3a, XLI, XLIX, 2. The epistle of St. John to the Hebrews abounds with the victories of holy men who by faith conquered kingdoms, stopped the mouths of lions, etc. Hebrews 11.33. While we read of such achievements, we should also take into account the victories, which are every day won by men eminent for faith, hope, and charity. In their interior and exterior conflicts with the demons, victories so numerous and so signal that were we spectators of them, we should deem no event more frequent occurrence, none of more glorious issue. It was with reference to such defeats of the enemies that St. John wrote, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. And that is 1 John 2, 13 and 14. I, I'm going to keep going just a smidge here where it says watchfulness. Satan, however, is not overcome. Sorry, Satan, however, is overcome not by indolence, sleep, wine, reveling, or lust. It's the holiday season, and once we fall into saying holiday instead of Christmas, yeah, those things come in. But it's saying here, Satan, however, is overcome not by indolence, sleep, wine, reveling, or lust, but by prayer, labor, watching, fasting, continence, and chastity. Watch ye and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Matthew twenty six forty one. As we have already said, is the admonition of our Lord. They who will make use of these weapons in the conflict put the enemy to flight, for the devil flees from those who resist him. James 4, 7. So considering your plans, make sure it's not quite Christmas yet. Make sure to work Christmas into your plans and some time for prayer. Sure, you can have some cookies, maybe sleep in a little bit, but I'm saying let's not sleep in all day, play video games, and get drunk. No, let's make sure it is Christmas. It is the day for going and celebrating our Lord and all things that are good. Um, spend some time in prayer. Can can you fast a little bit on Christmas? No, I don't think so. But maybe get ready to fast in the days to come. And not just because you're trying to work off the cookies, friends. Like, start incorporating it into your life. There's going to be many great programs coming up, I'm sure, just after Christmas to help you get ready for Lent already. Um, so start looking into those. Consider how you might give glory to the Lord. Okay, I'm totally understanding this book. Conscience ties into that. And they've really led us there, haven't they? I believe they've truly led us there. So let's look at the moral subject of conscience. I'm not conscious to myself of anything, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And I believe I put a bookmark in there. Hold on, 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Yep, bookmark still here as long as I don't drop it. So 1 Corinthians 4, let's see. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day. But neither do I judge my own self, for I am not conscious to myself of anything Yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge not before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise from God. But these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollo for your sakes, that in us you may learn that one be not puffed up against the other for another above that which is written. For who distinguisheth thee? Or what hast thou that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? You are now fool. You are now become rich. You reign without us. And I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us apostles, the last, as it were, men appointed to death. We are made a spectacle to the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, 
but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are without honor. Even unto this hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no fixed abode. And we labor working with our own hands. We are reviled and we bless, we are persecuted and we suffer it. We are blasphemed and we entreat. We are made as the refuge of this world, the scouring of all, even until now. I write not these things to confound you, but to admonish you as my dearest children. For if you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, by the gospel, I have begotten you. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. For this cause have I sent you to Timothy, who is my dearest son and faithful in the Lord, who will put you in mind of my ways, which are in Christ Jesus, as I teach everywhere in every church. And if I would not come to you, so some are puffed up. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them that are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in speech, but in power. What will you? Shall I come to you with a rod? We're in charity and in the spirit of meekness. That is strong. Let's get a little bit more instruction in here from the catechism on what's going on there. I'm excited to learn more on this. It says page 383. It's towards the second half of the book there. Yeah, second half of the book. 383. Uh Oh, There we are. We're in the part on the Decalogue. <clears throat> I'm going to assume 383. We're in the motives for observing the commandments. In these instructions, the pastor should propose to himself and to others the motives for keeping the commandments. God is the giver of the commandments. Well, that's a good reason there. Now, among all the motives which induce men to obey this law, the strongest is that God is its author. True, it is said to have been delivered by angels, Galatians 3.19. But no one can doubt that its author is God. This is most clear not only from the words of the legislator himself, which we shall shortly explain, but also from innumerable other passages of scripture that will readily occur to pastors. Who is not conscious that a law is inscribed on his heart by God, teaching him to distinguish good from evil, vice from virtue, justice from injustice? The force and import of this unwritten law do not conflict with that which is written. Who is there then who will dare to deny that God is the author of the written as he is of the unwritten law? But lest the people aware of the abrogation of the Mosaic law may imagine that the precepts of the Decalogue are no longer obligatory, it should be taught that when God gave the law to Moses, he did not so much establish a new code as render more luminous that divine light which the, that is the law of nature, which the depraved morals and long-continued perversity of man had at that time almost obscured. It is most certain that we are not bound to obey the commandments because they were delivered by Moses, but because they were implanted in the hearts of all and have been explained and confirmed by Christ our Lord. The reflection that God is the author of the law is highly useful and exercises great influence in persuading to its observance, for we cannot doubt his wisdom and justice, nor can we escape his infinite power and might. Hence, when by his prophets he commands the law to be observed, he proclaims that he is the Lord God. And the Decalogue itself opens, I am the Lord thy God, Exodus 22. And elsewhere we may read, if I am a master, where is my fear? That God has dined to make clear to us his holy will on which depends our eternal salvation is a consideration, which besides animating the faithful to the observance of his commandments must call forth their gratitude, again, gratitude, action and gratitude. Hence, scripture in more passages than one, recalling this great blessing, admonishes the people to recognize their own dignity and bounty of the Lord. Thus, in Deuteronomy, it is said, this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations that hearing all these precepts, they may say, Behold, a wise and understanding people, a great nation. Deuteronomy 4, 6. And again in the psalm we read, He hath not done in like manner to every nation, and his judgments he had not made manifest to them. Psalms 147, 20. This is again, again, reinforcing those concepts that we had earlier. One, Christ is the Lord. Two, we bear witness to him, and we either cause people to praise him or to blaspheme him. And how do we do that? 
through our gratitude in actions or our ingratitude in actions. So again, I think this is a great opportunity. Get a prayer journal, even if it's just an empty notebook that you have laying around, you can start on some paper, whatever you have, a notepad, you can even do it on your phone. So when you do your daily examine, you're going to look in gratitude. And then maybe, you know how in that exam, and you're normally looking for how God has moved that day in your life. So you can include in that how you've been moved to give glory to God. And maybe it was that day you were at lunch in the office and you realized that someone had forgotten their lunch or their credit card or just didn't have the money. Or maybe there's someone who's ill and I hear word on the street. Sometimes those lines for lunch can get a little crazy back in the offices right now. And maybe that person has some some condition which standing in a line would be a hardship for. And so maybe you offer to go physically get their lunch um, or you bring something back for them that's a little bit extra than they might have had. Um, Somebody who's on a call and been unable to leave their desk to go get their lunch. Maybe you pick up an extra sandwich or salad or something and bring it back to them or even just some sort of beverage to keep them going, right? So have some kindness in you as well there. So some way that that you were able to show the Christian life. Um, maybe you, you work completely from home so you don't see others, but you can give kindness and grace to people through Zoom calls and other ways as well. Um, And maybe you do something nice for your neighbors. Slip a little note in their mailbox. Sketch something in chalk on their driveway or on your driveway. Um, A little greeting to them as they're out walking. They're uh, pick up trash in your neighborhood. There are many things that you can do that are going to cause people just to pause. Or even we all see them, people in the grocery store and other public places that are wearing masks and appear very frightened of people. Now you can just go about your shopping and completely ignore them, but why not just give them a little grace, give them a little space, like wave and smile and stay back from them a little bit. Give them that little bit of extra space. It's probably going to take make your grocery shopping or whatever a little bit longer, but It's going to show them the grace. And that is a kindness that God has given to you. He's given you some good health. He has not let you fall into that fear. And so extend that, show that, give that grace to other people. And so that's something you can note in your examiner as well. So you're going to be doing some gratitude. You're going to be looking for how God is is working in your life through you right? Because sometimes you just look at the blessings and we think that's the gratitude. But sometimes God works in your life through humility or through a kindness to others. So keep looking for those things. Was there an opportunity where someone saw you do something and they gave praise, not to you, but to God? They were like, what's different about that person? You can kind of see that look on people's face sometimes. So consider that. Um, And it's saying, you know, God I love that. He hath not done in like manner to every nation and his judgments he hath not made manifest to them. So you really need to share that kindness with others. Let's move on here. I could I could probably go on this forever. Let's move on. 571. 571. Again, this is towards the back. There's one more after this. We'll close out for the day. 571. We're in the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. I'm not entirely sure because there are two here. It just, just says 571. Oh, oh, well, obviously this is it. <laughs> I see it now. So the, the third petition is thy will be done. And there's a section in here called man's blindness concerning God's will. I'm guessing that's it. And, you know, we always pray when we do our Lexio Divina. We do that prayer of St. Francis before the crucifix. And this is one of the things we ask for. We ask for um, the ability to discern and and do God's holy will. So let's read about man's blindness concerning God's will. Although man is continually beset by these evils, yet his greatest misery is that many of these appear to him not to be evils at all. It is a proof that of the most calamitous condition of man that he is so blinded by passion and cupidity as not to see that what he deems salutary generally contains a deadly poison, that he rushes headlong after these perniculous evils as if they were good and desirable, while those things which are really good and virtuous are shunned as the contrary. Of this false estimate and corrupt judgment of men, God thus expresses his detestation. How strong. Woe to you that 
call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5, 20. And again, I just mentioned St. Francis when St. Francis talks about after having met the leper on the road and being able to give him a kiss, that which was once bitter to me is now sweet. In order, therefore, to delineate in vivid coloring the misery of our condition, the sacred scriptures compares us to those who have lost their sense of taste and who, in consequence, loathe wholesome food and prefer that which is unwholesome. And that is quite the thing in this day and age. All the processed food that's out there, even those super highly processed meatless products, um, is that even food anymore? Like, what even is it? I feel like we're on the Jetsons taking those little pills. And in fact, um, a lot of people do take those little pills. You can get your greens in a capsule and thing like that. Now, there's <coughs> we're, we are doing that. Um, so it's very interesting. I'm just going to read that last paragraph again. In order, therefore, to delineate in vivid coloring the misery of our condition, the sacred scripture compares us to those who have lost their sense of taste and who, in consequence, loathe wholesome food and prefer that which is unwholesome. Uh, and we all know people who, during the time of COVID, lost their sense of smell and taste. And they were goofing around eating a lot of food that they normally wouldn't eat because they don't like the taste or the smell of it. And so they were being silly in doing it. Now imagine that we're out in the world and we've, we've lost that sense of what is good and right and just. And so we're out there doing things, um, tasting experiences that we really know we shouldn't be, but they don't seem bad to us anymore. They seem normal. They have normalized evil in so many ways. And we've all fallen into that. I, I, awesome if you haven't. I know I have. And so we're going to have to pray, thy will be done, the third petition to the Lord prayer. That had come up um, in conversation earlier today as well, to always end your prayers. We make all those great supplications, but we know that sometimes what we're praying for isn't actually good for us. So always end our prayers with thy will be done. Somebody had just said that to me today. How lovely and confirming that is. 596 is our last one for today. It's Still in the Lord's Prayer, but it's getting towards the end of the book, so the pages flip quickly. I am going to assume this is in Forgive Us Our Debts. Let's see here for the Lord's Prayer. Disposition. <coughs> Sorry. It says the difference between this and the preceding petitions. In this petition, we enter on a new manner of praying, for hitherto we ask God not only eternal and spiritual goods, but also transient and temporal advantages, whereas now we ask to be freed from evils of the soul and body of this life and of the life to come, which are dispositions with which this petition should be offered. We don't normally talk about what are the dispositions. Um, I did encounter that recently. You know, I'm getting ready to do my silent retreat. And the day of preparation talks about dispositions. What are dispositions? Let's just pause and look that word up. We don't discuss it very much at all. So I feel the need to look up this word just out of curiosity. Because I think I know what it means, but I've never actually looked it up. Dispositions definition. It is one's usual mood or temperament. Okay. A habitual inclination, a tendency, a physical property or tendency. So this is saying it's something so common to us. Oh, that sounds lovely if you've got a great disposition, but if you have um, some issues, maybe not. Let's look in another one. This is like a prevailing tendency, mood or inclination. Yikes. Your natural mental and emotional outlook or mood. State of mind regarding something. Yipes. I'm looking up a bunch of different dictionaries, hoping that it's going to be there. Mm. Really, I'm just looking up a whole variety here. The, quali the natural qualities of a person's character or a 
disposition to or towards something, disposition to do something, is a tendency to behave in a particular way. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for just a second. Ah, because I have mine sitting right here. I, I keep saying about a journal. It's because I bought myself a fancy journal. Okay, I bought myself a fancy journal, but it was while I was on vacation, so it should count as a souvenir. I don't buy like t-shirts and things as, okay, I bought one t-shirt on vacation, but okay, I bought two, but one was on clearance um, and one was supporting a children's charity. So just saying, but I tend to buy things that aren't very souvenir-y. So I got myself <laughs> this journal for my silent retreat. You see, be still and know that I am God. Telling me like, no, don't pick up that phone. No, don't do this. Don't do that. Um, thought that was a good journal for a silent retreat. And in it, I have a little handout on the dispositions for the 19th annotation, the spiritual exercises in everyday life. I will link this article in the description below as well. There's a lot here. Um, so I'm just going to give you the overview. Don't worry. They are a method or a process which leads us, those spiritual exercises are a method or a process which leads us through a series of prayer experiences to help us grow closer to God in Christ. They assist us in orienting our lives to God. Ooh, kind of makes you feel like the disposition. So if you don't have a great disposition on, if you don't have a great disposition, if the, the things we're going to talk about in a minute aren't your habit, Know that the spiritual exercises may help you in that turning to God and to make these things your dispositions. I like that. I like that. Um, this says Ignatius designed the exercises for two groups of people. Anyone who's making a significant decision and wants to discern God's will. See how that ties in. Or anyone who's already made those significant decisions but wishes to deepen their spiritual life. Um, da -da -da, da -da -da. So what are the dispositions? Here we are. They're calling them attitudes. <coughs> and they're saying these attitudes or dispositions are vital for the integrity of the process. So they are things, this is why you consider them on your day of preparation. And it's great to consider them now because we all know you're probably going to make some kind of New Year's resolutions in the next couple of weeks or days. So consider these before Christmas. The first one is freedom. Freedom. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so this is how Ignatius is talking about them in the language of the 16th century Spanish piety. You have to know that, the time and place for that. So he says the name spiritual exercises is given to any means of preparing and disposing your soul to rid itself of all its disordered affections. And then after the removal of seeking and finding God's will in the ordering of your life for the salvation of your souls. Okay, you're going to get rid of those icky parts of you. So we've been talking about conscience, right? We've been talking about that and seeking God's will. So freedom is going to be that twofold thing. First, we're going to try and get rid of all the junk, which Christmas is a great time for. We've had Advent. That's what we, Advent is a little Lent, right? We've been supposed to be examining ourselves, looking at that. And it's really easy to see a lot of those things as we get close to Christmas. And I think that's one of the reasons Christmas can be so depressing for so many people. I don't have my dad here anymore. I don't have the people who used to make my Christian life easy, who gave me that magic of Christmas. What is the magic of Christmas? It's the love of God. And there are people in your life who used to do that for you. We've been discussing that in the last couple of days in our videos. <coughs> There are people who used to do that for you, provide that for you. Could be a grandparent, a godparent, somebody, a neighbor, other people at church used to do a lot of that work to make those things for you, the, the feels, the smells and bells, right? And at some point, you have to take accountability for them. When you're not doing them yourselves, it's easy for other habits to sneak in because you weren't filled up with God. The other people were, and it was overflowing from them and flowing onto you, right? The, the Franciscan imagery of the fountain, it's not just Franciscan, but the image of the fountain, which is the love of God that overflowed so greatly into Jesus and their love overflows of the Holy Spirit. And that comes out to all of us, right? And that we go keep continually going to that fountain to be filled up so that we overflow in our lives to other people, right? And we have to keep going back because unlike the father and the son who have the perpetual, 
the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. We don't have that. We have to keep going back. And so people used to bring us that overflowing water, didn't they? Our parents, our godparents, grandparents, other people at church, our communities that we grew up in. If you grew up in a small town, it was other people filling it up and bringing us that water. Well, now we have to do it ourselves. And it gets harder and harder as you have fewer of those people in your community around you. Because more of that, even even as you get older, if there for a while, you're still getting some overflow from other people. And while you do have to fill up your own own little bucket, some of that is filled by other people. And as you get older, it feels sometimes like, like you're filling up more of that bucket. You're almost filling that whole bucket yourself. And that gets harder. Now you're walking to that fountain by yourself and you're having to fill the whole thing up by yourself. And we all know works better when shared. Um, and so it does get more challenging. And so when you're taking longer to fill up that bucket or you're not getting it filled up the whole way, that bucket's getting filled up with other things. Things of the world um, are just slipping in. Bad habits, bad thoughts, ingratitude to God, maybe some laziness, maybe maybe you have some addictions creeping in there, right? And that's what's going in your bucket and that's what's overflowing. And again, we've been talking about this this whole time. And so what do we want? We want to, if, if we use the analogy of a well, a well in the outdoors, <clears throat> your bucket may have gotten a hole in it, <laughs> right? And that old song, Dear Lies, Dear Lies, there's a hole in the bucket and we're going to have to fill that hole. And sometimes our wells get dirt and mud and muck. A well outside, that can happen to. I, I actually have a, a well on our house here. And you can get muck. You can get sediment. It can need to be cleaned out. You may need to like go out, dig this crap out, or maybe there's a bunch of gunk in your bucket. Have you cleaned your bucket recently? There may be some buildup in there. We need to go really scrub it out, clean it all out, and then fill it up to the brim with God. And that's what this freedom is saying. Freedom, the ability to fill the bucket completely with the light and love of God and let it spill over to others. And so we're going to have to spend some time looking at it, discerning what is good and bad and cleaning that bucket out. So freedom is the first one. I love that. Awareness. Okay. As you enter a sustained commitment to prayer, you'll become more adept at noticing how God is moving in you and in the surrounding world with which you exist. Through prayer, you may begin to understand your personal history in a new way, and you may see with new eyes how you've been loved by God throughout your life and grow in freedom to enter into those areas where you may experience pain, darkness, or distance from God in the past and find healing or peace. And it's going to tell you again about the role of a spiritual director here. You're not doing this yourself because it could get scary. And so some of that is looking at that. Oh, oh, I thought the bucket was this color. And it turns out it's rust. You know, you're going to become more aware of those things. Things that you may not have thought were bad before. You're realizing, oh, yikes, that's something growing on the inside of the bucket, you know. Now I need to clean that. Or you may look at some sort of pain and say, oh, I can see how God worked through that moment. You can put a patch on that. You can fill up that hole. You can scrub out that wound, clean it all up, put the patch on it, and then fill the bucket up. Right? Um, I think because we all learned this summer when I did that, uh, patching it up sounds great. And then you got to go fill the bucket up. Fill that hole up. Okay, I've put the patch over it. Now I need to make, I fill that up. I need, I need to really look at that moment and see the darkness in it, but see how God was moving in it and let him into it. Maybe I can't see it. Maybe I can't see how God was in it, but then just ask him to walk with you in that moment. And he'll probably show you some way that he helped you through there that you didn't notice. And that sparks into our gratitude again, right? And, and being the light of Christ. So let's look at the next one is perseverance. Given the busy and demanding lives we leave, to sustain the habit of daily prayer requires the gift of perseverance. As your spiritual director will emphasize, it is critical to identify a time, select a place, and design an environment for prayer. Ta-da! And then transitioning from the demands of your daily life will require careful thought and preparation, and then staying with prayer once you're there. Then you're going to pour your heart out to God and you're going to need to be able to take a moment to listen as well, right? And that all takes time. 
Again, this is a perfect time of year to be talking about this. You can do this. It can be part of your New Year's resolution. Clear, you're, you're going to put away the Christmas decorations, right? When you do that, think about a space. Maybe you want to leave that nativity set out. Maybe that nativity set, if you don't have any religious imagery in your house, you're still likely to have a nativity set. So maybe that could start your prayer space. Maybe leave that one out. Maybe start that as your prayer space. Has there been a time of day when you found yourself working on things um, for Christmas? Okay, you've already managed to set that time aside. Maybe make that your prayer time. Allow yourself a little bit of time um, to get into the moment. Work on your prayer habits. Think about how you've done things getting ready for Christmas, and you can do that, possibly apply that to your daily life. Great idea. Generosity. This one, it says... The person who receives the exercises will benefit greatly by entering upon them with great spirit and generosity towards their Lord and Creator and by offering all their desires and freedoms to Him so that His divine majesty can make use of their persons and all they possess in whatsoever way is according to most His most holy will. Thy will be done. Offer it all up to Him. He is so generous back like you cannot outdo the Lord in generosity. So offer it all to him and you will be rewarded greatly. So that's a great disposition. Wow, so much to consider. And yeah, I expect to see you back here tomorrow. Oh wait, we're not even there yet. Disposition of sin. We still have some here. Um, the first one is the acknowledgement of sin and then sorrow for sin. Oh my goodness, this is such a big section. I'm just going to refer you to looking at it. Um, it, it starts on page 596. So the first one is going to be, we need, I'm just going to read maybe the beginning of this. The, Admonish the faithful that he who comes to offer this petition. And we, we say the Lord's Prayer all the time. Forgive us our debts. Know what you're asking, friends. Know what you're asking. So you need to acknowledge your sins. You need to feel sorrow and compunction for your sins. You must be firmly convinced that to thinner, sinners who are thus disposed and prepared, God is willing to grant pardon. You need that confidence lest perhaps the bitter remembrance and acknowledgments of your sins will be followed by despair of, of pardon, which of old seized the mind of Cain, both whom looked upon God solely as an avenger and punisher, forgetting that he is also mild and merciful. Merciful. You need to acknowledge our sins and the bitterness of our souls. You need to fly to God as a father, not as a just to a judge imploring him to deal with us, not according to his justice, but to his mercy. You should be easily induced to acknowledge your sins if we listen to God himself admonishing us through the sacred scriptures in this regard. Read the Psalms. Read the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Christ the Lord, who spoke by mouth of all these, confirms their teaching by this petition in which he commands us to confess our sins. The Council of Milevi, the, the second Council of Milevi, forbids us to interpret it otherwise. It hath pleased the counsel that whosoever will have it, these words of the Lord's prayer, forgive us our debts, are said to be, are said by holy men in humility, not in truth. Let him be an anathema. For who can endure a person praying and lying, not to men, but to the Lord himself, saying with the lips that he desires to be forgiven, but with the heart that he has no debts to be forgiven. That is a heavy place to leave you tonight, but it is Chris, uh, yeah, I think this year it's Christmas Eve or it's the fourth Sunday of Advent, depending on what year you're looking at this. Um, so this is a thought to keep, keep you up at night and just to give you hope to run to the Father, which is a great night to run to the Father the night before our Savior is born. Friends, may God bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the good Lord bless you. In nomine Patris, Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. See you tomorrow.